So we're going to continue talking about integrals. Now, the first strategy that you use whenever you look at an integral is to try to find an antiderivative. That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to do. And through most of this course, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, but to be realistic, most of the time, in reality, that's actually not possible. Because, like, some functions you just can't find an antiderivative for at all. Like, it just straight up doesn't exist. And what I mean by that is, if you have a function like, say, this guy, which seems innocuous enough, turns out there is actually no antiderivative of this, which you can write in terms of elementary functions. Antiderivatives always exist. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that the, well, yeah, they always exist, but it may not be possible to write them using a formula, right? Using a formula that consists of functions which are easily computable. So uh, when I say that antiderivatives may not exist, I mean it might not exist in terms of elementary functions. So, you know, elementary functions are things like the trig functions, exponentials, logarithms, polynomials, rational functions, you know, everything that you're used to seeing in uh, algebra and trigonometry. So it may be impossible to find an antiderivative using those pretty restrictive uh, uh, tools. Um, more interesting to me, and really more relevant if you're going to be doing anything in science, is that the function you're trying to integrate might just not have a formula at all. Right? It might be raw data that's coming from an experiment. Like, for instance, it might, it might be velocity measurements, which was the, the whole motivation to start doing this in the first place. Is, you know, f was velocity, and you wanted to figure out the total distance that it traveled over some period of time. So if this is coming from raw data, well, there's no reason to suspect that this is going to conform to some formula that you can write down with, like, trig functions and what have you. So in a situation like that, we still need to be able to integrate it, even though the question of finding an antiderivative is, is moot. So we want to be able to compute integrals purely numerically, just using raw computational power. And of course, we did an example of that uh, last time in, I think, review part one, because the actual definition of an integral is already a recipe for computing it, at least approximately. You know, you chop an interval into subintervals, and then you add up all of these quantities here. You take some sample points in each of the subintervals, you perform all of these multiplications, and you add them all up. And uh, the approximation is better the more subintervals you cut the interval into. So this approximation gets better as n gets bigger. So in particular, notice that in this formula, the xi star, so these are just arbitrary sample points that we take within the subintervals, uh, those are arbitrarily chosen. So one thing that we can do immediately to get uh, approximate integration formulas is to just choose these sample points in a consistent way. So, for instance, if you choose the sample points to always be the left endpoints of the subintervals, you get what would be called the left endpoint approximation. And here is a formula for that. So here, the sample points are always the left endpoints, and here is a formula for them. So A because of course we're on the interval a to b. So a plus uh, some multiple of delta x, where recall, delta x is b minus a over n. So that's the width of the subintervals. So as you plug, you know, plug in i equals one, plug in i equals two, plug in i equals three, all the way up to i equals n, uh, and that gives you all of your sample points. Similarly, we could choose the sample points to be the right endpoint, and same exact thing results, just uh, offset by one. We could also choose our sample points to be the midpoints of these intervals, easily enough. And there's the formula for that. So recall, to get the midpoint of an interval, 
uh, it's just the average, right? The midpoint of a, a, a of a line segment is just the average of the two coordinates. So left endpoint plus right endpoint divided by two. And we call that the midpoint rule because as it happens, choosing the sample points to be the midpoints is already a fairly accurate approximation, uh, as we will see shortly, because we're going to do some examples. Now, those all follow directly from the definition of the definite integral. The accuracy of the Riemann sum, so the Riemann sum is this dude, this dude on the right, which, you know, is what we're actually computing. The accuracy of the Riemann sum increases as the number of subintervals increases. But that also means that we're doing a lot more computations. So as the number of subintervals increases, so does the amount of time needed to compute the Riemann sum. So we're so an efficient method of numerical integration is going to require formulas uh, which return the greatest accuracy for the smallest n. We want to find something more accurate than what just the definition gives us. So the formula for the Riemann sum in the definition comes from the assumption that the function we're integrating is approximately constant on the subintervals. And if the function's continuous, then this is reasonable. And although this is perfectly accurate in the limit as n goes to infinity, it is, in a sense, sort of the crudest assumption that we could make to say, well, I can't see it changing on the subinterval. Just say it's constant. But, well, you know, it probably has a bit more of a structure to it than that. Well, one way that we can possibly improve this assumption is to assume instead that the function is linear on the subintervals. So in other words, instead of the function being constant over these tiny little pieces, it is a line on these tiny little pieces. And in fact, if the function is differentiable, then that is a reasonable assumption to make. You know, if you can put a tangent line on the graph of a function, that's basically saying that the function looks like a line if you zoom in far enough. Uh, so. More specifically, uh, and to put symbols to the words that I'm using, uh, the better assumption is to say that on each of these subintervals, the function is the line connecting these two points on the graph, right? So you take two points on the graph of the function and connect them using a line. And you say, okay, that's the function. It is a line. Uh, furthermore, let's say that that line is denoted by L sub i, right? So this is just, this is, this is the, the function just on this little, little interval. So if x is inside this little interval, then the function is actually a line. That's the assumption that we're making now. So recall, again from the very first lecture, uh, if we're looking at this in the context of a particle moving in a straight line where f is the velocity, then these terms in the Riemann sum, you know, the, the terms that we're adding up, what do these guys actually represent? Well, they represent the total distance traveled over the little subintervals. And this is what you would get if you assume that the function is constant. Okay, well, now we're, assume, we're assuming that the function is linear on the subintervals. So what is the total distance traveled by the particle if the velocity is not constant, but linear instead? Well, it's the definite integral, right? I mean, that's literally what the definite integral was defined to be, is to give you the, the total distance traveled over an interval. So I will spare you the derivation here because uh, if you really want, you can figure out the formula for this line. It's the line that connects these two points. So, you know, that's uh, the point slope form of a line. Um, so yeah, you're just integrating a line. And since a line is y equals mx plus b, uh, you can anti-differentiate that, no problem. It's just the power rule. So if you do that, 
you work out all the details, which I'm omitting because they're tedious and not terribly enlightening, you end up getting this. So this expression gives you the total distance traveled by the particle if the velocity profile is linear on small subintervals. So it's this instead of this. Consequently, the formula for the approximate integral is what you would get when you sum all of these guys up over all the subintervals. Uh, so if you actually take this sum and write it out term by term, we get this formula, which is called the trapezoidal rule. So like, why are these twos here? Well, I mean, the first term of this guy is going to be x0 plus x1. Next, it's x1 plus x2, then x2 plus x3, then x3 plus x4. So, so there's a lot of double counting going on. So if you just combine those, you get all of these twos. Yeah, so that's where this formula comes from. Where delta x again is this dude, and the xi's can be given by this formula. So just, you know, even evenly spaced points on the interval. So make note that there is a coefficient of 2 on all of the internal summands, but not on the first and the last ones. So the pattern of coefficients is 1, 2, 2, 2, etc., 1. So that's one way in which this differs from just computing the Riemann sum directly from its formula, is that uh, now we have it divided by 2 out here, and we have all of these coefficients of 2 on the inside. That's Algebraically, that's really the only change once you get down to it. Uh, okay, so let's do an example. Use the trapezoidal rule and the midpoint rule to approximate this integral with five, uh, five subintervals. So first off, what do we have here? Uh, we need to write out all of the uh, ingredients in our recipe. So A is 1, B is 2. Uh, what is delta x? Delta x is B minus A over N, so that's 2 minus 1 over 5. So that is 1 fifth, so that's a 0.2. Okay, so that's the width of our subintervals in this case. First, we're going to use the trapezoidal rule. So what are the ingredients we need? Well, we've got delta x. Now we need our points. So we can get these points straight from this formula. So let's see. x sub 0. So x, uh, yeah, so x sub 0 is, um, is the left end point. So that's just going to be 1. That's the same as a x sub 1, well, that's what we get when we plug in 1 here. So that's just um, a plus delta x. So so really, I mean, this formula is correct, but I, I think you really don't need it because once you know what the delta x is, all you're doing is you're just adding delta x uh, consecutively. So what is x1? Well, it's 1 plus delta x, so that's 1.2. Similarly, x2, well, that's going to be 1.2 plus 0.2, so 1.4. Uh, add 0.2 again to get 1.6. Add 0.2 again to get 1.8. Add 0.2 again to get 2. Uh, and that's it, right? Because we're, we're going from 1 to 2. So start at 1, end at 2. So those are all the points that we need. There's five of them. Okay, so we've got all of our ingredients, so now let's just plug it into the formula. So, so this dude is approximately, uh, you know what, let me just copy and paste this. Right? Then instead of delta x, we have 
instead of x0, we have 1. Instead of x1, we have 1 1.2, 1 1.4. Eh, OK, so got to delete this bit because now it, it actually ends, right? We're only going up to 5. So the next one was 1.6. Uh, the next one was 1 1.8. And finally, f at 2. So remember, these coefficients of 2 are only for the interior points. The first and the last one do not have that 2 in front of it. That is crucial. Because, I mean, yeah, otherwise you're, you're just not getting the right number. So 0 0.2 divided by 2 is 0 0.1. So what is the function in this case? Well, the function is just 1 over x. So that's 1 over 1. Uh, 2, because we're multiplying by 2 now, so 2 over 1.2, 2 over 1.4, 2 over 1.6, 2 over 1.8, uh, 1 over 2, right? Again, don't forget, this last one doesn't have a 2 in front of it. And now what we need to do is just crunch those numbers. So I shall do that momentarily. So there are the, uh, <laughs> the very subtle sounds of me typing things into my calculator. Okay. Does it say anything about decimal points? Yeah, whatever. Uh, so six, nine, five, six. I'll put in four points of precision. So there we go. So there's our approximation. So this dude is approximately that. Uh, so that is using the trapezoidal rule. So that is going to be t sub 5, right? So the, the, the notation we're using here is we use a big T for the trapezoidal rule, and then we put uh, how the number of subintervals that we were using. So in this case, that was 5. So that's the trapezoidal rule. Next, we need to do the uh, midpoint rule. So let's see. What are the ingredients in the midpoint rule? Well, in the midpoint rule, we're literally just using the formula in the definition but these xi stars are the midpoints of all of the subintervals. So the xi stars are given by this formula. Well, okay. Uh, so what do we have here? So we have Okay, so it's uh, delta x first. Delta x was 0.2, right? I mean, you got, you've got a delta x in every term of the sum, so you can just factor it out. And, and then we're just going to add up the function at all of the midpoints. So let's see, what's the first midpoint? Well, that begs the question, what's the first subinterval? Well, we already computed the, the actual points themselves, you know, the points that make up the endpoints of our subintervals. So how do we get the midpoint from this? Well, the first midpoint is going to be the uh, whatever point is in between 1 and 1 1.2. So what's directly in, in the middle of 1 and 1 1.2? Well, that's 1.1. 1 .1. Next, what's between 1.2 1 and 1 1.4? That's 1 1.3. Next, what's between 1.4 1 and 1.6? That's 1.5. Well, again, we're, we're in the situation where we're just adding delta x at every step. So, you know, once you have the initial one, it's, it's easy. Once you have this initial point, just add delta x every single time. So next would be 1.7. Next would be 1.9, right? Because I'm just adding 0.2 at every step because that's our delta x. Uh, and that's it. Because n is equal to 5, so that means we only have 5 summands. So, this 
So once you go through the same computation again, again, f is just the reciprocal function, so I'm not going to write the whole thing out again. Uh, so what do we end up with? We're using the midpoint rule. So we're going to end up with 0 0.6912. Okay, so indeed, as you would expect, they're, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. Similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, now, if you don't already know the true value of the integral at the outset, uh, how are you supposed to know which of these is better, right? Which of these is actually the better approximation? Well, as it happens, we have a theorem for that. I'm not going to go into how these formulas are derived, uh, because that's that's like a graduate school topic, and honestly, I don't think it's terribly interesting. But uh, we can figure out, at least in a rough sense, uh, the error involved in our approximations. So when I say error, what do I actually mean? Well, I mean literally the difference between the true value of the integral and the approximated value. So, so the error here would be like 0.6919 minus whatever the true value was. So we have this theorem, uh, which it doesn't tell us the error exactly, but it tells us that the error is definitely going to be smaller than this quantity. So in a sense, this quantity is the biggest the error could possibly be for the trapezoidal and midpoint rules respectively. Uh, and it's just a formula. You know, what are the ingredients? Well, B, A, and N. We already know those at the outset. Uh, the only mysterious bit is now we have this big K. So what the heck is K? Well, K is an upper bound for the second derivative, or, or rather for the absolute value of the second derivative. So this is really the only additional thing that we would have to compute uh, uh, to get an idea of the error. So let's do an example of that. Let's give the upper bound for the error, in other words, these things, uh, involved in example one, so involved in the example we just did. Okay, so what are the ingredients? Well, we already have B, A, and N. So again, A was equal to one, B was equal to two, and N was equal to five. We need to compute k. We need to compute this mysterious new parameter. Well, how do we do that? Well, k is going to be an upper bound for the second derivative. So what's the second derivative? Well, that's going to be the second derivative of our function, which in this case was 1 over x. Uh, what am I doing? <laughs> there, if that notation makes any sense. Wait, hang on. There we go. Right, it's the second derivative of 1 over x. Well, what is 1 over x? Well, that's the same as x to the power negative 1. So if we're differentiating this, uh, we're just doing the power rule. So differentiate it once. You bring down the negative 1. So bring down the negative 1, and then subtract 1 from the exponent, right? So that's differentiating it once, but we still need to differentiate it again, because we need to know the second derivative. So differentiate it again, bring down the negative 2, so that becomes positive 2, because negative and negative cancel. What's negative 2 minus 1? That's negative 3, okay? So that's the second derivative. Now, what is the largest this could possibly be on, on this interval, mind you? Because, of course, th this thing might be unbounded. I mean, it is. You know, this is, uh, this is the same as this is the same as 2 over x cubed. And if you look at the graph of this, this guy has an asymptote at x equals 0. So it's unbounded. It goes up forever. So we, we just need to know how big it gets on the interval. So for 
So for x between 1 and 2, what is the biggest this thing can possibly get? And strictly speaking, we're talking about the absolute value, but on this interval, this guy's always going to be positive anyway. So how big can 2 over x cubed possibly get? Uh, well, think about the graph of this thing. Like I just said, I mean, we're, we're dividing by 0 here, so that means it has to have a vertical asymptote at 0. Uh, so it's infinitely tall at 0, but then as you start moving forward, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So uh, this is a decreasing function. Right? If you don't trust me, then just look at the graph. Right? Just go to GeoGebra and, and just type in 2 over x cubed and look at the graph. Clearly, it's decreasing as you go to the right. This is a decreasing function, so uh, it will be at its smallest at x equals 2, and it'll be at its largest at x equals 1. because it's, it's decreasing. So as you go to the right, it's getting smaller and smaller. So what's the largest it can possibly get? Well, whatever it is when x is equal to 1. So, so plugging in x equals 1, we get that k, which is the biggest this can possibly get, is just uh, 2 over 1 cubed right? Literally just plugging in one. So that's just two. Okay. Uh, so that's it. That's all that we need. Now we just need to plug, now we just need to plug our data into these two things, into these two formulas to get the error bounds. So plugging this data into the formulas What do we get? Well, for the trapezoidal rule, let's see. So replace k with 2, replace b with 2, replace a with 1, replace n with 5. So n squared becomes uh, 25. So let's see, what is that? Uh, that's just 2 over 12 times 25. So that's 25. There we go. So uh, again, I'm just using four significant figures here. So for the trapezoidal rule, I mean, we know that this guy isn't the correct answer, but we certainly know that the error the error is going to be smaller than this. So, so it is, yeah. So if you use the trapezoidal rule, then the error is guaranteed to be smaller than this number. So that's at least some sense of the accuracy. It's not perfect, but I mean, yeah, it's impossible for it to be perfect in a, in a finite universe. And then for the midpoint rule, so once again, that becomes 2, that becomes 1. n squared is 5 squared, so that becomes 25. And let's see, what is that? That's just 2 over 24 times 25. So we get 0 0.003333. So the maximum error for the midpoint rule is actually smaller. Now notice, that doesn't actually tell you that the error for the midpoint rule is smaller. We don't know what the error is. We don't know what these errors are. It's, it's impossible to know it without knowing the answer in the first place. Uh, so it may, it may still be the case that, that, the, uh, that the trapezoidal rule gives you the better answer, but chances are, based on this computation here, chances are the midpoint rule is actually better for this particular example, for this particular function.
So, yep. Uh, okay. So that's, yeah, the trapezoidal rule and the midpoint rule. So in the midpoint rule, you assume that the function is constant on small subintervals. For the trapezoidal rule, you assume that the function is linear on small intervals. For Simpson's rule, you assume that the function is quadratic on small subintervals. We're, we're, we're stepping up by one on, on, the, uh, on the powers of the functions we're looking at. Because a constant function, they, I mean, that's a polynomial of power zero. A linear function, that's a, a polynomial of, um, I'm sorry, degree, not power. So a linear function, that's a function of degree one. A quadratic function, that's a function of degree two. In other words, the highest power is two. So you can see that we're, we're, we're stepping up by one uh, on each step here. And we get a different integration formula each time. Uh, so that's basically what we what I say here. Uh, yeah, so so one reason that we might suspect the trapezoidal rule to be more accurate uh, is because in assuming that the function is linear on a small subinterval, we are sampling two points from each subinterval instead of just one. So it stands to reason that we can get even more accurate approximations by sampling three points from each subinterval. And of course, you can keep you can keep on going from there. Although if you sample too many points, then it becomes compu too computationally expensive. So if you sample three points from each subinterval, uh, that means that you can fit a parabola to the function. Uh, uh, you can fit a parabola to those three points because a parabola only requires three points to be uniquely identified. Uh, so yeah, so that's where Simpson's rule comes from. We basically do the same derivation as up here, but instead of assuming that the function is a line on, on the subintervals, we're assuming that the function is a parabola on the subintervals. And that's how we get Simpson's rule. So I'm not going to go through the details because, again, they're not terribly enlightening and they're, they're really tedious. Uh, but yeah, you work through all the math and you end up with this formula. So notice how it's different. Now we have a delta x over 3, whereas before we had a delta x over 2. And notice the coefficient pattern on the inside. So there's a 1 here, then 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. It just alternates. 2, 4, 1. Right? So, so the pattern of the coefficients, it has to start with a 1, 4, 2. It has to end with a 2, 4, 1. And then on the inside, it's constantly alternating between 4 and 2. So that's, that's the pattern here. So let's use Simpson's rule on this integral. So same one that we've been looking at. So same data as before. A equals 1. B equals 2. N equals 5. Delta x equals 0.2. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we, we already have all the data, so let's just fill in the formula. So uh, this is Simpson's rule, so now we're using the symbol s to denote the approximation. So let's see, delta x over 3, so 0.2 over 3, and then... So if I put parentheses down here, they might they might look better. Uh, so let's see. So f at so the points that we're plugging in here are are just literally the sample points. So what were the sample points again? They were these guys. So one, one point two, one point four, one point six, and so on. So let's see, next is a four. So it has to start with one, four, two. Yeah. Uh, and then it alternates between twos and fours. So the next one is gonna be a four. The next one is gonna be a two. Uh, and then we're already done. So yeah, so there's the final one. So it, it does match the pattern. It starts with 1, 4, 2. It ends with 4, 2, 1. And, well, there's nothing in the middle in this case, but 
it's it's alternating. So yeah, it's correct. So if you go ahead and plug in all of that data, so again, same function again. The function is just reciprocation. What do we end up with? We get six five eight two. Okay, so again, a very, very slightly different. So 6582 versus 6919 versus 6956. So it's actually, it's very different. These guys both had 69 as their first two digits. This one has 65 as their first two digits. So that means either this is a lot more accurate than the other two approximations were, or a lot less accurate. Uh, I'm going to put my money on this one being a lot more accurate. Well, once again, how can we possibly know whether it's accurate or not? Well, we've got an error bound. And it's, again, a formula that's very similar to the ones that came before. Uh, very slightly different. So instead of n squared, now it's n to the power 4. Uh, and whereas before k was an upper bound for the second derivative of f, now k is an upper bound for the fourth derivative of f. Yeah, so I don't exactly remember how these are derived. I know I've seen it done once before, but it's not its not very interesting. It's just very tedious. I, I remember the derivation for these things as being like really painful. Uh, okay, so as our final example here, because this is it, this is all that I have to say for this for this section. Uh, how large should we take n in order to guarantee that the Simpson's rule approximation is accurate to within four decimal places? That's a practical question, right? I mean, if if you have a if you're in like an engineering project or a science project, then there is a certain level of precision that you demand. So the question then is, well, how big should I take n to make it exactly as precise as I need, you know, save on computing resources, compute only the amount that you absolutely need, and, and, and no more. So our strategy for this is going to be uh, to make this error bound smaller than this number. Because then, yeah, the error is guaranteed to be smaller than this. So we want the error to be smaller than that. One way that we can guarantee this is by taking this upper bound and ensuring that it's smaller than 0 .001, 0 0001. Uh And n is our variable, right? Because it's asking us how large should we make n. So, so the question is asking us, what is n uh, that guarantees that this number is going to be smaller than that. So choose n large enough so that this equation holds. Right? Because then the error, which is smaller than this, is definitely going to be smaller than this. Uh, and we already have all of our data. We, I mean, it's the same example. So, so we already know that k is 2. Oh my god. So we have the same data as before, uh, except now n is a variable. Right? We're not declaring a variable of, or uh, a value of n anymore. So let's see. How big should we make n such that this inequality holds true? Well, k is 2, b is 2, and a is 1. So what is this here? Well, so that's that's the inequality that we're trying to solve. Solve this inequality for n. Right, because then we'll know how big n needs to be. So let's see. 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 to the 5th power is still 1, so the numerator is just 2. Uh, and you know what, I don't like putting all of these zeros, so I'm going to write this instead. 
right? This is the same as 10 to the negative 4. So if I rearrange this, uh, let's multiply both sides by n to the power 4. Okay, multiply both sides by n to the power 4. Uh, n to the power 4 is certainly going to be a positive number, so that doesn't change the inequality. Now let's take the 10 to the negative 4 and move that to the other side. So dividing by 10 to the negative 4 is the same as multiplying by 10 to the positive 4. So now to get n, we just take the fourth root of both sides. And trust me that taking roots doesn't affect inequalities, as it happens. So we take this dude, take the fourth root. OK. So as long as we take n to be bigger than this number, uh, we will have the level of precision that we want. So now what is this number? Well, let's just plug and chug. So 2 times 10 to the power 4 divided by 180 raised to the fourth power. Uh, I get 3.2. It's around 3.25. Uh, now n is an integer. So that means that if we take n to be at least 4, then, then, then this will work. So if n is greater than 4, uh, Simpson's rule will return the uh, desired precision. So indeed, as we suspected, or as I suspected, as I said, uh, Simpson's rule is way, way more accurate than the other two rules. Because, uh, I mean, we took n equal. Oh, I messed up. I was supposed to do n equals 10. I did n equals 5 instead. Uh, whatever. Whatever. I, I think it's I think it's better to do to do the comparison. It's it's better to do n equals five anyway because then it's a more direct comparison with these with these two. Uh, so yeah. So so to get so to get precision to four decimal places, as it happens, we only needed n equals four, and we took n equals five. So, indeed, it's good, good precision. That means that it's correct up to four decimal points. So that means that S sub four, so the approximation that you would get using four subintervals is correct to uh, four decimal points. Or maybe it's three decimal points. Eh, whatever. So, yep, that's uh, some of the cool stuff that you can do with those error bounds. And, like, I can't say that you would necessarily ever be doing this by hand, but I can say for certain that uh, if, if there's ever, like, an AutoCAD or, you know, some, some sort of mathematical software uh, used in engineering or science or whatever, uh, it's doing some form of numerical integration under the hood, so it's it, it's probably got Simpson's rule in there somewhere. Uh, anytime it computes some sort of quantity that requires integration, so like for for real computational science on the ground, uh, this is this is how integration is done. Um, it's still important to know that that. You know the fundamental theorem of calculus exists and that you can take antiderivatives because if you can actually find an antiderivative of the integral then 
just evaluating the antiderivative is probably going to be really, really computationally cheap, uh, as opposed to, you know, adding up a whole bunch of these things. Um, so yeah, if if later on you take like a computer science course or a numerical analysis course, then then you would be looking at this stuff in much more detail. But um, I would say in the quote unquote real world, uh, this is how integration is actually done, right? It's only ever done approximately, and it's done with like clever formulas. Um, and not necessarily with antiderivatives, except maybe in really, really special cases where the antiderivatives can actually be found, and evaluating evaluating the antiderivatives is cheap. Yeah, so so in the real world, you know, when you're doing large-scale problems, large-scale computation, which is part of what I do in mathematical biology, it's like large-scale computation, uh, you become very, very cognizant of the computer resources that you're using. And if you can, for instance, do a numerical integration in four steps as opposed to 10, uh, that's big. Like, like that's really important. That's a really important gain. So yeah, uh, not much to this section other than just plugging stuff into formulas, but conceptually, I think it's really important to, to, to show you uh, uh, how math is applied uh, in a real context. So, all right, that's all I have for this particular lecture. Goodbye.